And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of The Hidden Isle, a tarot RPG of sorcery and adventure, the one and only George Hobmeyer. How are you doing today? Hello, Sam? hello. Or tonight? I'm fine. Case. Tonight, that's that's right. Thanks for having me. I'm doing fine. My voice is a bit raspy, so the listeners uh, forgive me, but uh, I'm here to tell you all about our wonderful new creation. Mm -hmm. Well, nothing, nothing a bit of tea and honey can't fix. Exactly. Or monk fruit in my case, though I usually tell people to be careful with that stuff. Monk fruit is very strong. You're you're not supposed to use a full teaspoon of it. I have no idea about it, but it hasn't come across my way yet. <laughs> it's it's something that I gotta go out of my way to get to get, but I've seen I've seen people um do a whole do a whole teaspoon of it and then end up and then end up doing spit takes because they put too much in dear lord yeah, i'm just looking at it right now it looks um yeah strong and of course then i have to go i, I told you but you didn't listen <laughs> not to not to say i told you so but i did but i but oh a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings in a sense so let so walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. So I'm a fairly old person. I'm I just turned forty six. So um, I was always hugely into fantasy as a child, but uh, growing up in the eighties in Austria and Tyrol to be precise, there wasn't really a lot around. You know, like the the world was already particularly the English speaking one was already infested with uh, Dungeons and Dragons. But we didn't have so much in Central Europe. Um, that's the story of many European countries. And then a game called Das Schwarze Auge, the Black Eye, came around, and I got extremely hooked on it. Like uh, hooked in a way that my parents were scared. Like you're always playing this game and you're always reading these books. Your grades are dropping. We're afraid, and I'm like, I'm reading and I'm writing. What do you want? So um, that kind of stuck with me for. Um, a very, very, very long time. Uh, I would say like almost like two decades. And then I kind of moved away from this entire um, um, field. And uh, that was mainly because I li really, like literally physically moved away. I didn't have my group anymore. I moved to other countries. It was not really, yeah. Tabletop role-playing kind of was also like uh, gone for me, not really accessible anymore. Mm -hmm. And then I started working in video games um, after some strange <laughs> adventures or misadventures, depending on the interpretation, in theater and related performing arts. So all actually quite good for, you know, like working in games and also tabletop role-playing games. Mm -hmm. And um, essentially, I worked for about a decade in, uh, in video games, uh, mainly really strange corners, narrative design, I did a lot of political games um, and lots of like custom installation for museums and stuff. And then in 2016, I started to work with tarot cards because I got really annoyed by working with computers. Like, I didn't want to spend my free time or, or like at least like a hundred percent of my work with fucking pardon. I swear. I'm not sure if this is legal on no, this podcast. No but, worries. Swear. Okay. No rules against fucking game here. engines. And it was just so annoying. And there was always technical problems here, technical problems there. And then I started to tinker again with analog game design and so particularly with tarot cards and, uh, started to work on a board game, and because I'm a narrative designer, I kind of started to surround the entire idea of the board game with a lore. Mm -hmm. So there was supposed to be this magical island in the 16th century where people were like seeking refuge from 
the orthodox powers of the world. Mm -hmm. And there they could like live in freedom, you know, and follow their, um, you know, their, uh, their pursue any wisdom that they want to, or any forms of knowledge that they want to kind of investigate without any control. Mm -hmm. And, and also play games as much as they want, because this was also something that was fairly regulated in Europe in the Middle Ages, like card games were <laughs> of the devil. So there was always guilds of card makers, and then they were gone. And then, you know, there was like a big renaissance in, in some form of play, even theater, and then he was banned again. So it was a kind of a, a wild time with people being obsessed with games and then being banned again. So this was also something this island would be obsessed with and then yeah based on that i actually built uh the first project within this ip it was a board game called sephiroth mm -hmm. and this did pretty well and i mean sephiroth is, a, is not a very complex game but it's really made for people who like tarot cards so within that particular group it worked extremely well like the kickstarter we made uh, with it had almost four hundred thousand euros and thousands of supporters, and there was a separate tower deck that also sold really well. And then for the follow-up, we we kind of looked at it and we we're like, well, this board game idea is nice, but I think I think we want to do something with tabletop role-playing because it's something that we are personally getting into a lot. We had new people in the company who were really into it. We did like a third solo project before that. And then we're like, well, let's get into it, shall we? And then we sat down with a couple of designers that we already worked with and uh, started to essentially develop this system. And I think the other thing is that everyone really felt like doing it. We, at the end of the day, you know, we had a much stronger connection to the medium tabletop role-playing game mm -hmm. than we had to the medium board game. And we knew that if we would kind of twist it a little bit into that direction, you know, like, and when I mean everyone, I mean the artists, the producers, uh, the game designers. So then we could really thrive. So that's what we did. And because we were, we were like a commercial company, you know, with clients and, and stuff, we could actually throw like a, a fairly big amount of resources onto the project and have the designer work uh, full time for almost eight months on the project before we started to share it with the public. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those were the, the beginnings. This is how, how the hidden isle was born. Yep. Now the, the other thing that I couldn't help but notice is, is just right out of the gate. You have it, you have it labeled as forged in the dark in the, especially in the playtest materials. Um, Walk me through how you first got exposed to um, Blades in the Dark and, su and subsequently the myriad of stuff that's using that system that has the Forged in the Dark label. Um, full disclosure, um, that is not my corner of the design process. Um, that is essentially, this is something that, that Danny Adams brought to the table. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I can recall the first discussion that we had with him. Like he's 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 like a he's a trained game designer, but he has like an even bigger and also more broader tabletop role playing background than any of us. Um, maybe not as our producer. I think he might be the the, the biggest of them all, uh, Sean Bourgeois. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, Danny came very early and said like, uh, um, "I don't want to copy that system, you know, where there's a lot." a lot in this particular system that we can build on, you know, and I know that this is not, this wouldn't be, a, and then me, you know, being, you know, also like having always my legal hat on, going like, yeah, but this is legal, you know, can we do it? What is the licensing thing? Like, no, 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 we're not going to, we're not going to copy it. We're just going to, it's going to get inspired bait on points X, Y, Z, like other people did as well. And then I'm like, wow, okay, this, this is interesting. So I think for them, it was, uh, yeah, it, it it was very much the the models of character development, you know, and, and, and group dynamics that was that was so interesting for them. So this is like like the way how the game actually creates a social interaction, you know, and coherent storytelling. And 
that was essentially the one of the foundations then that they tried to like create the hidden aisle system on as well mm -hmm. and within that uh, shifting shifting into the tarot thing uh, since you had been spending a bit of time with um ter with tarot in your opinion what what, what was it about tarot that drew you to the point where you wanted to build whole games utilizing it uh, this is actually this is now this is a question i can fully answer because this is something that i brought onto the table so um dealing with tarot cards was a bit of a youth thing for me um but i had my like truly first esoteric wave when i well as a teenager believed quote unquote into it mm -hmm. and then i had Probably like 10 years ago, I started to like revisit that and go like, well, don't believe any of this anymore in terms of supernatural forces, etc. But I think it's from uh, like the history of its ideas, you know, and the, if you if you look at it from a more psychology, it's extremely interesting. And what I really liked about tarot from a game design perspective, that it's this extremely modular tokens of ideas that automatically combine with each other. So the cards are made in a way that they, they immediately evoke something and that they are very, very easy to connect to. So what I was interested in from the very beginning is to use cards mm -hmm. as something that generates ideas and generates stories. So, I mean, that's not new, but uh, this is something I wanted to explore as well. Yeah. And, and this is also interesting in the board game. You know, you can play the board game by yourself but at the same time, you weave the story, and it can be a story about yourself, it can be a story about someone else, it can be a story when two people play together. And this was essentially one of the foundations then as well for, uh, for the game as well. You know, these cards, they become these starting points for uh, stories to unfold. And because they, are, they have been developed for now hmm, more than 200 years in that particular respect, you know, they really know how to connect to everyone's uh, psyche. So, and for, from my perspective, and I've, I've mentioned this many times, there are not enough um, role-playing games out there that utilize cards. And when I say that, I mean utilize cards as one of their, as one of their primary motifs. Mm -hmm. uh, because whenever I say that, somebody inevitably brings up Savage Worlds, and they're and I'm like, that does not count because that's just initiative. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm am talking the cards are the cards are used as the primary mechanic, and I I partially blame um, Dragonlance Fifth Age back in the '90s for um, opening my eyes to the concept. Um, and that and um, ev that and Everway, which is a interesting beast because it isn't operating on success or failure metrics but rather what happens next and you go into its fortune deck which is it's not exactly a tarot deck but it is heavily inspired by the concept uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that it's just that it's built around the f the um four hellenistic elements instead of I was going to say inst instead of the Minor Arcana, but then I remembered, wait, the suits in the Minor Arcana are also use those same four elements. So, so like Yeah, well, this yeah, this 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 uh, division in four pillars is actually fairly common. You actually, I, I'm trying to think of any card games. Yeah, most card games used in the world use these four suits. But like yeah. the, 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 the vast majority, put, let's put it that way. Yeah. And each, each of the four suits in the Minor Arcana has one has one of the four elements it's associated with, like how swords is associated with um, air, and of, and of course the same the same applies with the other th with the other three suits. But I, this would be a this would be a good a, of a time as any that since the since there's a heavy association with the Minor Arcana on on just the character sheets alone. Um, is it is it a case where this is a game only using the minor arcana or are you using the whole deck and the major arcana has its own purpose? Well, um, 
the actually the you use a full tower deck, and when I say full tower deck, I mean seventy eight cards. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, th- I think by now you can say seventy eight. That's a, that's the a standard. Um, I mean, there is some deviation, but the, the the two main schools, Marseille and Rider Waite Smith, they use this card system. Mm-hmm. In our case, we actually have two separate card pools that we always split and never mix, and. Uh, one pool is all the aces, all the number cards, like from uh, then, well, the rest is like from two to ten. Mm-hmm. That's your challenge pool, and that is being handled completely differently. And then there is the vision pool, and the vision pool is used. Um, that's the court cards and the major arcana, so some of the minor arcanas and some of the major arcanas. Mm-hmm. And these are the cards that you essentially use to. Uh, generate stories, for example. You know, you, you're about to meet someone in a tavern and you don't know what it, what, who this person is. And then you can draw and essentially decide with the vision card who the mystery person is that will help you find that lost horse or whatever you're seeking. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that you could actually even draw as well, what you're looking for. So, and so essentially, the vision cards are, are are strange because they also you also use them for character creation. So everything that is connected to like psychology, character, story, people, and even like uh, social dynamics, this is what you use vision cards for. And then everything you know that is connected to any form of skills and challenge, you use this other pool for. Mm-hmm. So, with that now, with that in mind. Uh... I can't. I can't see why um, why Forged in the Dark was um, was chosen because because it it's a very natural fit, especially in a setting where you're not, where you're not going to be going ar- you're not going to be going around all that much outside of the er- the um, Discordia um, area, and this so that's the kind of thing this is naturally built for, but. I would like to di- like to dive a little bit into the particular archetypes, the playbooks, as it as it were, just to get a feel for um, what their particular kit is and what sort of play style that they're encouraging. You mean the uh, the different agents, the the agent types, the characters? Yes. Sure. Um, so we'll start with. I'm going from top to bottom as the as they are in that image on the Kickstarter. Um, so sure. I'm starting with the hunter. Oh yes, yeah. The, the hunter is. Uh, I'm actually have to also have to draw up all the all the different characters, and then I have to be careful because some characters have not even been revealed yet. Mm-hmm. So where is my amazing character chart? Well, I, I don't need I don't need the chart for the hunter. The hunter is really for someone who likes to, yeah, um, <laughs> kill people essentially. It's it's a fairly straightforward uh, combat based class, but not so much from a psychological point of view that you want to you know battle and protect people. It's really about like ending other people's lives. More the of way a, more how... an assassin than a fighter. More of an assassin, but think of it more like as a hunter of humans. So, and and in in that way, you know, they are absolutely uh, brutal. Think uh, John Wick, you know. John they're, Wick, they're, AD, uh, Agent Forty Seven, that particular um, area. Exactly. So, um, and they also have like like some. Some particular skills, you know, like advanced matchlock rifles that you might not uh, find kind of in a in, in, in a widespread way. So they can kill from a distance. Um, they will not kind of go in valiantly into battle. That's not their point. They really try to like uh, go for their aim and then just uh, get it out of the way. So absolutely ruthless and uh, very much feared as well. But then, not great at parties at the same time. Under- understandable when when their whole when their whole thing is um, removing things from existence. Um, 
Exactly. And there's also no code of honor that you'll find with the other really, uh, really fighter based class champions, you know, because those are really about almost like more like the, the performance of the fighting, you know, in connection to their value, you know. So for them, it's important, you know, if I fight, you know, like I do it in the name of chivalry, in the name of my faith, in the name of like protecting this person I'm with. So there's always a, a certain sense of, uh, showmanship with that you know like i want to show the world that i'm fighting and i'm doing it for something good you know and then i want everyone the good guys and the bad guys see whatever is being fought here you know it happens because of this particular code mm -hmm. uh, so next next on my list is the champion yeah that's the one that i already mentioned right now so mm -hmm. these are yeah these are devotees you know of some deeply held uh, held code, and that's a bit of a like a like a like a paradox, obviously, you know, because you have this island mm -hmm. that doesn't have a code uh, in the sense of like a, everything is true, everything is permitted, but at the same time, you know, these people have a code, and the the obvious universal code in that sense is always the protection of the weak mm -hmm. and the protection of knowledge. And this is what these champions then stand for, you know, and like, and if you look at their skills, you know, like they, it's more, yeah, as, as I already mentioned, it's, it's more performative, you know, like they, they can also hold speeches, you know, and intimidate their enemies, guard someone, and uh, yeah, are like, really like, pinpoint the battle in a particular way, you know, like, challenge the bad guy and in the inside of the battle and then that that person can not escape so that person needs to fight you mm -hmm. so <clears throat> the third one on my list is the occultist yeah this is this is one of my favorite classes and i'm also playing an occultist right now in one of my solo adventures so these are really experts to manipulate spirits, energy, and outer-worldly forces. Mm -hmm. They can also manipulate weather, like which is, I think, is like one of the coolest uh, kills ever. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a very aggressive magic, um, and it has its limitations. Uh, so I've been playing an occultist in, in more social settings. And if you compare it to, to the illusionist, for example, like your options are limited. And at the end, you always end up like going into the basement well, and finding like some poor lost spirit in there that you then question because yeah, the, the living can be reached other way, in other ways. But they are extremely fun to play as well because who does not want to control the dead, you know, or call upon pagan entities or uh, manipulate the weather. Um, they also have a couple of skills that are fairly unusual. Like there's this strange teleport, for example, that they can do. It's called swap, where you trade position with another person who you can see. This is great. If you want to, if you see a guard up on a really, really high uh, wall, you're up there and they're down there and and your colleagues are going to beat them up, and then you're going to throw a um, um, a rope down. So um, versatile, but again, um, they're not made for everything, you know. But they have they have their own very own particular skill set, and it is something for the shadows, you know. This is not a this is not a class that just like walks around and does straight things, you know. Like this is. This is very clandestine and nocturnal stuff, you know, because whatever, whatever this class does, it will get you, especially outside of this core, it will get you into trouble. Mm -hmm. the, thir the third one that I have on my list is the Prowler. Oh, yes. Uh, so the Prowler, the Prowler is, uh, is essentially... Um, I would say a, a rather enhanced thief um, that has like a very broad skill set that uh, you can use for all sorts of thievery. 
clandestine. It has a lot to do with burglary, with being unseen. You're a master of stealth. You also have particular instincts as well. Um, this class also has like, uh, like even besides their more magical uh, attributes that they learn, you know, they can deal with, uh, you know, pretty much every lock that they encounter mm. or scale walls just with their, with their base uh, challenges that they can do. So this is extremely practical to have someone like that, obviously, in in the company. And then it also, I think if you don't want to go, if you want to go in more into a heist uh, directory, a direction, uh, this is something that I would really recommend. I mean, there is particular setup for groups that are a little bit more brutal and direct, but if you want to play it elegantly, you do need a prowler. Mm-hmm. Like otherwise, how are you going to go into all these all these um, uh, different buildings you have to break into to do things the elegant way? The prowler ends up reminding me of Garrett from the Thief series. Oh yeah, that's a that's a that's a good comparison, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, Garrett Garrett's not he's not a master swordsman, he's not a master marksman, he's a thief. <laughs> and that and um even though even though it has a de- even though those games had a decent combat system, um trying to get trying to get into a fight is the last thing that you'd want to do you'd want to do because you're gonna be outnumbered very fast. Um Yeah, exactly. I mean this is the the prowler is the prowler is not made for a fight, you know, it's really made for like Many other kind of really skillful uh, achievements, but like facing another person in a fight is really something that they they probably also want to avoid, and they are not encouraged in their training. I mean, this is another important thing to say. You know, like uh, every different class is trained from a particular guild. So, prowlers are from the guild of shadows, hunters from the guild of wolves, occultists from the guild of spirits. And so forth. So um, they don't learn that uh, by themselves, but they are like uh, very trained professionals in that regard. Mm. And again, yeah, the the prowlers don't learn how to like do one-on-one fights because it's also a stupid thing to fight someone one-on-one. You know, the ch- unless you're really, really good in it, the chances are always that you might die yeah. for in one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Now. The last one that I want I want to cover, since there's some that um, that on the Kickstarter page that didn't even have art, <clears throat> at, le- at least not yet, is the Illusionist. Oh yeah, this is where we actually finished the art uh, on Friday. Um, yeah, this is this is a more classical magician. You know, they can bend perception. Um, they can throw up glamours around themselves. But they can also manipulate people's mind. And um, this is an interesting one. Um, and if you look at it for the first time, you go like, wow, this is this is OP, you know, you can control people's mind. But the thing is, like these these challenges that you're drawing, um, magic needs to come from somewhere. And unless you stumble upon an artifact, you know, that where you can siphon off power in a very limited capacity you're always using yourself to draw the power from. So this is, this is the whole challenge. And I've seen, I've seen parties where you had like very powerful illusionists or very powerful siphoners, and they would do nothing for the entire game because they knew if they fuck it up, you know, they, they're just going to be with a migraine and just running after everyone else and being completely incapacity, uh, incapable of performing magic. So you need to kind of wait your turn to in order to like really do something because you might otherwise pay the price. And then there's no more magic, you know, if you damage if you damage yourself too heavily in the challenge. So extremely powerful class, but at the same time, especially stuff where you read someone's mind, you will get uh, uh, this damage form called spiritual harm or trauma. 
So a trauma is irreversible spiritual damage that you have to work on to essentially uh, do between scenarios in order to get it removed. So it's that's a dangerous path as well. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing I the thing I'd want to move in move into is how your is how um this game in particular is handling magic. Um. With both with both magic sources and um, proficiencies, and from what I understand, the approach that you have is that there's not really a ma there's not really a list of spells like in some more traditional approaches, but rather a si rather a series of choices and consequences. Yeah. Uh, so I think the, the 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 most important thing is that. Um, Magic isn't like ether or something. Magic is not magic isn't something defined where you can draw from, mm -hmm. but magic comes from various uh, sources, and all of these sources are permitted. Um, but uh, essentially, none of these sources are like safe, safe. So that means there's always consequences to to magic. And this is why it has to be approached uh, um, extremely carefully. In particular, if you look at summoning, for example, you know, you can lose your character, <laughs> which is something that uh, obviously like the uh, game master will discuss with you if you start to like summon demons, you know, they will eat your soul. They might give you extremely powerful spells for a very short time, but then that's it, you know, then you're... You're, you're crippled uh, because there is consequences with dealing with fallen angels. So, um, yeah. Sources and consequences, essentially. That's a, that's a really, really important point. Mm -hmm. And I think also, like, uh, the other point is uh, every source gives you, obviously different types of power like if you want to um, mass enchant uh, a, a, a group of people probably will not do you any good to kind of uh, try to harness the power of a natural spirit for that but you have to find something you know that always works with that you know like maybe a particular type of demon or a particular kind of angel would work with that. So you always have to find the, the right type of source. Then all of these sources come with particular consequences. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's a uh, good a good way to approach it because a lot of within within a lot of um, a lot of fiction and a lot of games, there's a bit of a disconnect with how magic is utilized because with a lot of games. And obviously, this is a consequence of them being games. Um, mag magic is treated as having a set amount of effects. But when we look at magic users, whether it whether it be whether it be spellcasters or something else in fi in fiction, even when there are rules to how magic works, which there have to be. If you're not doing that, then you are um, doing it wrong. Um, there's not a, there's not necessarily a defined list, uh, and going more narrativist allows more to have a bit of a middle ground when it comes to that issue. You know, yep. because you you don't see not see. I know this is a really obvious. Ex I was going to go with the obvious example with Gandalf, but no, I'm going to go with John Constantine instead. You don't see him pulling out a spell list. <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, what what I find, what I kind of like about what James Patton, who is really like the main designer in this of this particular section of the game, like what, I think he he's heavily inspired by actual magic, you know, like how um, how magic was essentially described by I actually do have the book here in my hands right now, mm -hmm. Agrippa of of Nettesheim, for example, he has a book called the Occulta Philosophia, and uh, this is actual 16th century magic you know mm -hmm. and 
the funny thing is, you know, that there is like simple spells and they are described, you know, like how to put a particular symbol on your oven so the, the bread works better. So it's almost, yeah, it's almost psychology. And then the more complex stuff, you know, always involves some sort of entity. So uh, you will never find spells, you know, like if you do that and that and that, you know, you can multiply uh, gold in large quantities. This always involves the invocation of superior forces that are much bigger and come from different planes of existence. And it is actually quite interesting because the trade-off changes, you know, you can do small things, you know, and you can do obviously all these magic uh, classes, they also have their abilities, you know, but you need to kind of connect to higher forces who come with consequences in the system. And yeah, and this is exactly how magic was described in a uh, particular Renaissance literature about it. Mm -hmm. And that of, that of course is going to give some grounding, especially with the the, fa the fact that, so that even if Discordia is its own um, region, it's, sti it's still drawing heavily upon the, the, the scene that was, that was about, for lack of a better term, in the 16th century. Um, yeah, very much so, and even multiple ones. So, because it's a safe haven, you know, it doesn't doesn't just extra like a it, it doesn't just uh, connect to like one particular region. You know, but people might come from all over. They might come from England. Uh, they might come from you know the regions dominated by the Roman Catholic League, which were very aggressive with ink with Inquisition, or they might even come from the actual neighboring Ottoman Empire. And all of them have extremely interesting, uh, like, concepts of magic. Um, by the way, and uh, what I like, <laughs> there, there is a list of further reading within the core book. This is not in the playtesting material. And, and one, uh, <laughs> one text even has, like, a, a warning. Shams al-Ma'arif uh, by Ahmad al-Buni. This, this book is widely regarded as a cursed text. Explore at your own risk. So uh, we have a reading list of actual real-life magic books, uh, but some of them are apparently cursed. Um, I, I read a little bit more about the book. It's not really cursed, but uh, yeah, it's considered black magic. So mm -hmm. people don't like black magic. It's not black magic. It's just talismans mainly. Mm -hmm. But with that, with that said, uh when it come now, given given the ident given the identity and sense of identity, I should say, of Discordia, I'd be remiss if I did not try and dive into a kind of appendix and to bring people into the concept. Um, are you familiar with the concept of appendix N? Uh, no, I am not. Um, this is something that comes from from early D and D, and it's kind of been used as a shorthand for a similar concept. Um, oh, okay, I understand. Yep. Of, so I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying an actual appendix appendix N. It's just that's the shorthand name for this idea. Um, of it start in old in old school D and D. It was a list of for of um, further media, whether it whether it be books, whether it be films, whether it be comics, and so on. What would you say would be some of the things in the Hidden Isles appendix N? To kind to kind of help people get a feel for what sort of what sort of setting it's depicting, because obviously with a game like this, the locate the rules and the lore are um, far more intertwined. Okay, this will be this will be very surprising now because I'm not going to point at a space opera. Um, um, yeah, surpri is... surprising to most, maybe not surprising to me. <laughs> so. Um... Th this is really pointing at the concept of how agents operate. And the agents operate not as differently as the agents of culture and special circumstances in the culture series of Ian and Banks. Um, and this is really coming from the idea that uh, the culture is, in a nutshell, it's, a, it's this massive space-faring 
AI powered um, space civilizations that holds all sorts of people within themselves. And they are so utopian that actually everything is okay with them. But then they do meddle with their neighbors' affairs. Uh, and they do so openly in, uh, with a uh, group called Contact. And if Contact fails, they use special circumstances. Special circumstances where things get really murky and dirty. And it's quite interesting because this is something where the moral high ground of the place really starts to kind of a blur. And this is something that we really used quite, quite a lot as a concept for ourselves as well. Um, and then there's another really strange one. It's uh, Cities of the Red Knight by William Burroughs. Um, who is a heroin infused beat author that was pretty, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of counterculture literature. Yeah? And then he wrote this a very, very wild, organized slash disorganized uh, book about pirate cities and how they dwell on the edge of existence of, of reality and are like the secret free havens. So this is also like not from uh, like a classical fantasy uh, background, but this comes really more from like a 20th century more experimental literature. But it's pretty cool, like the, because they also have like systems of magic, and uh, yeah, these safe havens against orthodox forces. So this was actually highly influential for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I must say, these curiously enough, you know, like these were like the um, some of the main influences for us. And although they're not really classical in the sense of like, a, oh, we had this other 16th century novel that we looked at or this other 16th century system, you know, they were fairly important to us, mm -hmm. particularly in the way how, well, again, the Ian and Bank, Banks wants the way how agents operate and, you know, how this whole idea of Dioscoria is, oh, we are the good guys. You know, but if you if you murder other people, you know, maybe you're not the good guys anymore. You know, what happens then? You know, if you if you need to like go to really extreme measures, you know, then this this whole concept starts to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And I, and with that in with that in mind, um, I also I also would be remiss if I didn't bring up the. Um, solitaire rules, which is, it's some it's something that's not exactly common, but I but not exactly uncommon either. It is something I'm seeing more I'm seeing more and more of um, games to providing a separate solitaire rule set. Was was that something that you had pushed for? Or was that pushed by one of the one of the other um, partners within the team? Well, um, it kind of came a bit naturally because. The very first board game was a solo game, um, and we had a few con a few solo concepts laying around as well. We did a, sh a short uh, standalone Merc Borg esque uh, game called Ma Magdeburg in between, which is about like a in kind of a neighboring period. It's about the siege and destruction of the city of Magdeburg in Germany. Gruesome affair. So we wrote it on the on the solo thing. And then, uh, essentially, the solo thing was always there, but we never really thought that that people would really want it. So we were like, yeah, you can play it solo, you know, and we exchanged a few ideas. But then when the campaign went live, and when, or even before that, actually, when the when the playtesting play material went live in the month before that, people were like, oh, I want to play it solo. Can I play it solo? And we're like, sure. And we just expanded, essentially, on the ideas that were already on the table. And I used it a couple of times now in Instagram live streams, and it's it's a hoot. It's it's really fun to play. And I think the interesting thing is, you know, that you don't have any form of uh, you're not going through a playbook like a um, like another one of these classic playbooks. You know, you really go into the unknown. I think this is quite interesting compared to uh, also other systems you know you like it's a, it's a solo game but it's very 
it can take you to all sorts of different places, surprising ones as well. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? Mm. Um, I think by now we have about so 230 pages. So will be quite a quite a sizable book from what I can uh, from from what I can tell. I think I have some test materials laying around here as well. So it will be like a like a fairly thick one, you know. Also considering the fact that it's a hardcover with a decent quality, and so this is what people can look forward to. Mm -hmm. There's still more ideas that uh, we wanted to pursue, but the campaign. Uh, yeah, didn't didn't allow like the full <laughs> explosion of ideas. It was it was a busy October, so uh, people also gave money to other campaigns, obviously. Yeah, but um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Mm, well, we're gonna soft launch it. Um, so whoever backs the campaign will have. Um, access to like pre-release versions mm -hmm. and those are fairly advanced. I mean, I think by now, like, especially on the, on the level of writing, um, I'm probably people can expect to, to get pre-release versions already by late January, mm -hmm. digital version probably by, yeah, don't nail me down on that on April, hopefully. And the moment the digital version is out means essentially that the other version already went into print. So it means we'll be starting shipping in the months after that. So I think in the late summer of 24, we'll be releasing it officially to, uh, yeah, obviously our own shop, but also to like retail partners that we are currently talking to. And I'll certainly be keeping an eye out for when that comes. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, it was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk about it. And despite my role being not so much focused on like uh, the nitty gritty of the rule, like, uh, yeah, uh, Danny, for example, like I hope I, I made sense and could uh, people inform a little bit about the game. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Wonderful. I'll be happy to come back, you know, and I'm going to have future plans. And uh, once they unfold, I'm very happy to share it with the other people in this uh, wonderful temple complex. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>